Hey guys, welcome back to the shop and welcome back to the video series on the Precision Matthews TL1640. In this video, we're going to go through everything. Uh, all the bells, all the whistles, everything I love about this machine, all the reasons why I bought the machine, all the reasons why you should get this machine. Um, we're going to play with it. We're going to cut metal. Uh, I'm going to show you all the accuracy. Anything I can think of, I'm going to show you about it. This is, this is the... The, uh, the real showcasing video uh, of this whole entire series. Now I had some time to, uh, to actually familiarize myself with the machine and, and do some jobs on it. So there's been a bit of a, a time lapse in between the last video, but like I said, uh, you know, I, I had some jobs in the shop here, which actually gave me a lot of time to use the machine and really become acquainted with it. Um, so I have some accessories that I want to show you, some things that I did to customize it. So without any delay, we're going to just jump right into it. So first and foremost, why did I get this machine, right? I've been working in the shop here now for several years doing the, the Maple Lane business. And, um, and I had a, a little South Bend 10 inch lathe, which, you know, I, I loved dearly. Um, but what I did was I outgrew it. And with the variety of work that my customer was giving me, I ran into many, many challenges with that small lathe and trying to get around them often became dangerous. Um, not to mention the work envelope in some of my jobs was just too big for the, the little machine to handle. So I kind of came up with like my top 10 reasons um, and there's a lot more, but I, I have top 10 reasons. Why did I get this machine? The first and foremost reason was a bigger spindle bore. Um, this machine back here has a two and a half, not two inches, but two and a half inch spindle bore. Actually, it's a little bit bigger than two and a half. It's 2.550. So it's, uh, it's a little bit bigger than two and a half to allow two and a half inch stock to, uh, to pass through it. So to put that into perspective, this right here is what's going to fit through that spindle. All right. This is a two and a half inch piece of stainless steel here. And that fits right through the, uh, the spindle bore. The second one, just an overall gearhead lathe I wanted. I wanted a bigger, stronger machine that didn't have a belt, that wouldn't slip, something bigger and beefy. The third reason was I wanted incredible accuracy. There's a lot of jobs that I have. They call sometimes for tenths. Uh, you know, a couple, uh, couple here, a couple there, right? A little bit of the tolerance. But I wanted a really accurate machine. Uh, the fourth reason, coolant. I wanted a coolant system on my machine. Um, goes without saying, right? Number five, I wanted metric thread capability. So much of the medical industry is, is, uh, is, is metric. So almost 50% almost of the jobs that I do for my customer is in metric. So I, I, I wanted that. Um, I wanted, uh, I wanted flat spaces. I know that sounds weird, but some of the old lathes, like my old South Bend, had very curved uh, castings. I wanted flat castings on my, on my tailstock, on my compound. I wanted to be able to mount indicators or cameras to make videos, um, you know, things like that. And I also wanted the ease of installing a DRO. Uh, installing a DRO in this machine was a piece of cake. It really was. Um, because of the, the, you know, just the symmetrical nature of the castings. Um, number seven reason, I wanted more tailstock length. This thing back here has about six inches of tailstock travel. I'll have to check my notes the exact, you know, to get the exact number, but it's, I believe it's around six inches of, uh, of travel, which is amazing. Um, I wanted a splash guard. Right? My old lathe didn't have a splash guard, so I wanted, uh, wanted a splash guard to keep everything clean, neat, and, uh, and tucked away. Um, number nine, parts are readily available for this machine. You know, when you, when you get the machine, you have a, a, a whole uh, parts list, and you get any part at any time, which is fantastic. Um, and number 10 was the fantastic reputation of uh, Precision Matthews. I mean, I, I've yet to find somebody unhappy with it. Um, which played a big role in, uh, in you know, researching what kind of a machine that I want. Uh, that, was, that was key. You know, uh, Matt, who you know, owns the company, his reputation is solid. Everybody said he's a great dude. Give him a call. Um, 
and you know he lived up to that reputation. Real, real, real cool guy. Uh, easy to talk to. Super helpful. Knows his his uh, you know knows his stuff about these machines. He's constantly flying overseas, uh, doing quality control and stuff like that. So, you know, the owner of the company stands by the products, and you know the reputation of the of the machines themselves. So, that's that's why I got the lathe. So the standard features that came with my lathe is a 9-inch 3-jaw chuck. Uh, it's a D16 spindle. There's a spindle sleeve that comes with it, which has a MT4. It reduces down to MT4. Uh, it's got a tailstock center. It's got a spindle center. Also comes with a thread chasing dial. I know some lathes, that's an option. This one came with it, which is great. Uh, it's got a feed rod clutch. So when you're turning to a shoulder, you just feed, you know, you turn your feet on and it'll stop and shut right off, which is really nice. Uh, mine came with a steady rest. It came with a follower rest. It came with a face plate. And I opted for a four jaw chuck. I don't think the four jaw chuck came standard, but I, I ordered one, right? You need a four jaw chuck. Comes with a coolant system. It also has a foot brake. Some of the capacities for the machine are as follows. Headstock center to tailstock center, 40 inches. The swing over the bed is 16 inches. The swing over the cross slide is 10 inches. The swing over the gap is 23 inches. The gap insert length is 10 inches. The cross slide travel is 8 and 3 quarter inches. And the compound slide, the travel is 4 inches, 15 sixteenths, so just under 5 inches. The machine has 16 speeds. There's a low range, mid range, and high range. And uh, the lowest speed in the low range is 36 RPM, so that's really slow for threading or whatever you, uh, whatever you might find the need for 36 RPMs for. Uh, and it goes all the way up to 1800 RPMs. Both inch and metric dials, it has both inch and metric threading. The tailstock is MT4, it's got six inches of travel, and it has um, a two inch quill diameter so it's it's very rigid it's very beefy the length of the machine is about 89 inches the weight of the machine this one uh, back here this uh, 16 inches is about 3500 pounds and it's a 3 amp uh, 5 horsepower motor requiring a 30 amp breaker so ordering and the delivery of this machine was was really easy uh, it all started with an email to Matt and we started to uh, have some correspondence back and forth. We discussed all the options, everything that I wanted. Um, I actually got on the phone with him then and was asking him, you know, a lot of detailed questions about the machine, uh, really seeing like which machine would best suit my needs. Um, we discussed the payment methods and stuff. Everything was very, very simple. Uh, the delivery was very fast. Now I'm in Pennsylvania, as is uh, Quality Machine Tools, Precision Matthews. Uh, they're in the western end, I'm in the eastern end, so delivery was, I think, a day. Um, what I had to do was, because this machine is so big, if you're thinking about getting this machine, or even the 14-inch, you're going to need a rigger, um, depending, I, you know, I say that lightly, depending on what kind of equipment that you have. Uh, my shop is in a two-car uh, two garage, and I don't have any kind of machinery moving equipment. I don't have any... Uh, forklifts or, or uh, front end loaders or nothing like that. So I needed to have a rigger come in and deliver the machine and actually get it into, into my garage here and place it. Um, but that was easy too. So I, I, contacted, I contacted my local uh, rigging company. I found a, a good company at a good price. And uh, of course they would accept the machine. So, so Matt shipped this lathe to my rigging company and the rigging company brought it here. It was a fast operation, obviously. Uh, um, I have the video on that. You could see that's actually the first video in the series. So that went smooth and everything was pretty hassle-free. Um, the machine, obviously, uh, you probably seen in, in the other video, um, the machine comes coated in the, the rust preventative or Cosmoline. Uh, so you're gonna have to clean the machine and, and uh, you know, remove all that stuff. All right, as stated, the machine is 89 inches long and 39 inches deep. Both take into consideration the length of the handles on the tailstock and on the crossfeed, which are a couple of inches. So I made appropriate space in the shop. And now for, for power, I have an American Rotary, Rotary Phase Converter. 
It's a 10 horsepower, and I, I believe they say the rule of thumb is whatever your motor size is, you should double that with your rotary phase converter. So um, the 10 horsepower covers that just fine. That machine will start with the big chuck, the big nine inch chuck will start spinning instantly up in high speed, 1800, RP, 1800 RPMs in a flash. So that's very impressive. Uh, so if you want any in additional information, any more detailed information on that, check out the first video in this uh, series. So now, without further talking, we're gonna jump in and I'm gonna go over all the features of the machine. So this top section here is the spindle speed. Uh, we have three main ranges. We got low, medium, and high, and we have four speeds across those three ranges. This lever here switches between your low, medium, and high, and also gives you neutral. And this lever here switches between speeds one through four. Uh, the lowest speed we have is low range 36, and the highest is 1800. Um, moving on to this middle section, this is your feed and your threading pitches. So we have both metric and inches, and this lever here will control your reverse or forward of, of the feed, um, low, neutral, and high. Here's your metric pitches, your inch uh, pitches, diametrical pitch, and just straight feed for the carriage. All right, so this lower section here has a bunch of different controls. This right here, this lever here is our coolant. This is our power light and our main power. So let's begin by turning the power on. I, I just put the rotary phase converter on. You might be able to hear it. Okay, so now we have main power to the lathe and we have the indicator light. This uh, push button here is our jog. And what it does is it spins the spindle. I'm in neutral right now. So if I was to put that in low, that's actually spinning the spindle. All these levers and this shifter in conjunction controls all your thread pitches. So in the middle section up here, you would look up, let's say for example, 20 threads per inch. So I'm looking up 20 threads per inch and it's LBS3V. So I switch over to L, to B, to, uh, to S, Okay, V, there we go, we're in, we're in V, and three. So that, that's right here, it's actually in three. So now we're set up to thread uh, 20 threads per inch. This panel right here says, remove this plate to gain access to the feed clutch. Behind this panel is actual uh, control where you can set the slip, the, the clutch slip of the actual feed stop. And I'm going to show you that when I demo the machine, but basically what that is, is when the, when the machine is feeding the carriage, there's a sliding stop that slides along this rod right here, and you can move that to anywhere you want to go, and as soon as the carriage hits that, it triggers the, the feed to stop, and so it's, it allows you to thread to a, a shoulder. It's a really great feature. My machine has the 9-inch uh, three-jaw chuck. I forgot to mention this before, but I have a micrometer carriage stop. You, know, you just lock it down wherever you want and the carriage will stop to it with micrometer adjustment. Here's where the gap is located. There's six screws that you take out and you'll remove your gap so you could swing larger pieces of uh, stock. Here's our threading lead screw. This is our feed rod and this is the machine control rod. All right, so now on to the carriage. So up top here, we have our top slide uh, or compound, depending on what you want to call it. We have inch and metric dials. Our cross slide, same thing, inch metric dials. With a flip of the scale, you got metric, and you flip it back, and we got uh, inch. This is obviously our carriage, uh, carriage handle. This is our feed, uh, longitudinal feed and cross feed. Pulling this, pulling this out gives us longitudinal feed. Pushing it in gives us cross feed. I'll demonstrate that in a second. Here's our threading handle. This is the one-shot oiler, just like a bridge port. Press this in, press it in a couple times, and voila, all your waves on the carriage are oiled. I really like that. Not a lot of lathes have that, 
this one does, and it was a it was a huge um, selling point for me. Right here is where we fill the oil. That's your filler cap right here. I don't have to take that off. Here's your carriage locking bolt and threading dial. This down here is the feed direction quick change knob. So in an instant, you pull it and it will reverse. Push it back in, it will go in the opposite direction. And this is the motor start and stop handle. Okay, uh, forward, you push it down. And up is in reverse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how all this stuff works. So like I said, if we pull this out, we have longitudinal feed, quick change, feed direction. Pretty cool, right? Pushing in gives us our cross slide auto feed. Pretty cool. The carriage has a, a dial on it, so you can actually track how far you're going. I have a DRO, but if you don't, you can track your travel through the, through the dial. Down over here, this sight glass shows you how, uh, how much oil you have in your carriage. So if you're getting low, you could actually see that you're getting low and you could fill it up here. One of the things I mentioned earlier was these flat castings. The, the compound is flat and the, uh, the cross slide here is flat. And this is great if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to mount a GoPro here to film some of your work. If you want to put uh, indicator stands on here, magnetic bases, whatever. It really helps. Um, and it's one of the things that I mentioned earlier that was, uh, it was very appealing to me. All right, on to the tailstock. We've got an MT4 internal taper. We got inch and metric scales on here. A two inch wide quill. I think I misspoke before and said it was around two and a half. This is a two inch wide quill. Uh, here's your quill lock handle. Here is your tailstock lock handle. We got two ball oilers here to lube it up. And, uh, and we have a scale, a travel scale back here as well. So you could, you know, you could kind of dial in a nice fine feed. Down over here is an oil reservoir. Um, this is where all the lead screw, the carriage feed rod, and the motor control, they all, they all um, lock in place here, and they got bearings here, and they're obviously they're held in place here. And this is where you can oil it. Down below, we got our humongous uh, drawer-like chip tray. Holds a lot, of, uh, a lot of chips. Very easy to clean out. You just pull it out. You could even remove the whole thing if you needed to. I just kind of slide mine out. There's some stops over here so it doesn't dump out and fall and, uh, and hurt you. Nice removable chip tray. The return for the coolant is right in there as a screen. Down along here is our safety brake. You press that down with your foot and that chuck stops. And I'm gonna show you that right now. So we're gonna shift this guy into high speed. High speed for, I'm going to tighten the jaws on the chuck. I don't like to have loose jaws on the chuck when you're running it in high speed. Two things we're going to demonstrate. You're going to see how fast this uh, starts right up with the rotary phase converter. We're in high speed, so this is 1800 RPMs with the uh, nine inch chuck. And I'm going to hit the brake and it's going to come to a complete stop. There you go. 1800 RPMs with that big chuck, that came to a real quick, uh, real quick stop. I want to demonstrate now the, uh, the feed clutch here. So this is basically when you're trying to turn to a, a shoulder and you want the, uh, the carriage to just automatically stop. So let's just say right here is where we wanted to lock it. No hands, watch, it will stop just stops just like that and then you could turn it and go back and you could see how the the uh, the feed keeps going pretty cool and a really great feature to have one of the great features on this machine is the work light uh, you can position it anywhere it's, it's very rigid very bright and uh, and it's LED so it's it throws no heat I could literally put my hand right on the glass and you know, nothing. 
So nice, convenient work light. We could position it anywhere we need it to go, and it's a great feature. Another thing that I got for the lathe here is a DRO. This model is an Electronica EL400, and these are five micron scales, so they'll go down to tenths, you know, ten thousandths of an inch. Um, the way I have, the way they display are slightly different for the Z scale and the X scale. On the X scale, we will actually read single tenths. If I turn, you could see it's seven, six, five, four, and that's uh, that's highly accurate for turning to diameters. I have it set up so I'm only looking at thousands here on my Z scale because I never really turn to you know to that tight of a tolerance on a shoulder. Um, but if I needed to, I could pull this piece of tape off that I have blocking it here. It just makes it easier for me to read. Um, these just go to straight you know regular thousands. But this will read in tenths, but it'll it'll display by you know every two, so two, four, six, eight. Whereas this one will do one, two, three, four, all the way up single digit tenths. So this DRO has plenty of features. We could switch between inches, millimeters. Um, there are tool offsets and a bunch of other different programs. I would download the information uh, to find out more what this uh, DRO offers. So before we cut any metal, let's, uh, let's put an indicator on the machine, check how tight it is, check some tolerances, all that good stuff. We have our tailstock that's not locked. You can see it's not locked. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extend the quill out the full six inches, and I'm not gonna lock it. Five, six, okay? So it's basically at six. Uh, I'm going to get in front of the camera here for a second and I'm going to just set our indicator as such and I'm going to try to zero that as best I can. Apologize for getting in the middle of the camera. Okay, I got it pretty good. I'm going to move the carriage which the indicator is on and we're going to just basically Traverse to the all the way to the end. Now the way the ca now the way the camera is uh, is facing, it looks like it might be off a couple of tenths. But if I simply just align it exactly the way I'm looking at it, it's on zero. We have a really nice. <laughs> A very nice tight quill. That's fantastic. Um, and that's not even locked. You know, I haven't even locked it yet. Um, I've used this before and the, uh, the alignment is really, really nice. What we're going to do now is we're going to set up, we're going to put the indicator onto the spindle and check for any run out. All right, I've moved my indicator now over to the spindle and I put it on the inside taper and I've loaded up an interrapid tenths indicator. Tenths meaning ten thousandths of an inch. Uh, I have the spindle in neutral and I have it positioned as close to zero as I could get it. You know these things are finicky and I'm just turning by hand the, uh, the spindle. It's in neutral. And you know it doesn't look like it's really moving off its mark. Oh, it moved a little bit there but it's staying right at the zero mark. So I would say that that's pretty damn accurate. Let's move on to another test. All right, same indicator, same indicator stand, uh, only we have it on the outside of the taper. Now I'm gonna hold the jog button in. And you can see that it's it's got less than a ten thousandth of an inch of movement. All right, so now we, we have uh, an incredible amount of accuracy on the outside taper as well as the inside taper of the spindle. Um, actually, you know what we'll do is we'll, we'll run a test on how flat this surface is right here. All right, I've set up the indicator very carefully so it won't hit 
any of these holes. There's holes there and there's holes there. So this indicator is little, literally riding between the little tiny amount of space that resides between both of them. I will use the jog and I hope the, uh, I hope the camera gets in there well enough. When I, when I bend over and I look, I could see that there's movement that's less than a ten thousandth of an inch. And it might be hard to pick that up on the camera. Um, and there's some oil, I guess a little residue here, but again, we have an incredibly, uh, an incredibly flat reference surface uh, perpendicular to the spindle. So again, great, great accuracy. So here's our reducing sleeve. Here's an MT4 dead center. Another MT4 dead center for the tail stock. Take our test bar, put our indicator on here. Again, those flat surfaces make mounting indicators really easy. So let's get this thing positioned and see what our travel looks like. So I'm going handheld with the iPhone here because it's just going to be easier, but this is the test we're performing. We're trying to see how uh, vertically the tailstock is aligned with the spindle. I'm letting the indicator creep off of the indicator bar and let's just zoom in a little bit better so you could see. And we're going to just try to have it register on. All right, so we're about one, two, three tenths before the zero. So as I traverse this thing down, and again, apologies for it being handheld. So we're about a half of a tenth difference. And to be honest with you, that could just be the movement in the indicator because when I grab the carriage and I move it forward, you could see it, it, it starts to change and move. So we have, uh, we have very incredible accuracy uh, with tailstock to spindle alignment. Like most uh, spindles and chucks, I have a witness mark to align the chuck to the same uh, cams. So I take up all the slack just so the chuck doesn't fall off the spindle. All right, that's on there. All right, so as you can see, we have a piece of 304 stainless mounted in the chuck. It, is, it was the example that I was showing you. It's uh, two and a half inches wide. Calculated the RPMs to 304. Uh, 305 actually. I have it set to 620 though because this is carbide, it's an insert and this is a big machine so I want to show you exactly what it can do. So we're going to touch off, I'm going to go in a uh, hundred thousandths which will be fifty thousandths depth of cut. So, touch off, I'm feeding in one hundred thousandths which is fifty thousandths depth of cut and here we go. And as you can see, it just contacted an area, so it's actually deeper now. And now it's going to hit another shoulder. And the machine is not flinching one bit. How about we do uh, 250. All right. So that is, uh, that's quite a, quite a beefy cut there. It's a 120. It's a, it's yeah, it's an eighth of an inch. We'll start some coolant. And here we go. Ah, oh, what my poor camera goes through. All right, we're gonna pause to clean the camera because we have a mess on our hands. 
All right, we're going to try to take a hundred thousandths uh, depth of cut right now in this 304 stainless uh, without making too much of a mess. So we're going to touch off. I'm going to zero my DRO and we're going to bring it to 200. As you could hear, it's peeling it off beautifully. Beautiful finish. Let's do an accuracy test now. All right, so this measurement here is one inch, 800 and two thousandths. I'm going to zero my DRO. <clears throat> I'm going to feed in, I don't know, 15 thousandths, 20 thousand, 20, 23 thousandths. We're looking for one inch, seven, seven, nine. Dead nuts. Our next example is gonna be some, uh, some 17.4, and this is stainless steel as well. I switched over to a CCMT. It's a smaller uh, carbide insert. Um, it's got a nice sharp point on it, and we're gonna just do some test cuts and some accuracy tests. We'll touch off. set our DRO and let's go for um, let's go for 50 thousandths I don't have this thing cranking at really high rpm Now you could see the grooved finish in there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slow the feed down a little bit and uh, we're going to bring it down to about, let's say four thousandths per rev, which is LC2, LCS2W, LCS2W. We're going to do the same thing for another 50 thousandths depth of cut. See if we get a better finish on that. Oh yeah, and now we could even throw some coolant on there. Keeping things nice, you can see the chips have uh, changed back to silver. All right, let's shut the coolant off. Silky smooth. All right, let's do an accuracy test now. See where we're at. 856 and 3 tenths. I'm going to bring it to 800. So we will touch off. 
very carefully. There we go. Reset our DRO, and we're going to do 56.3. Get a little coolant going, keep things nice. And let's see what we got. One tenth. 800 and 1 tenth. So you could actually see how accurate this machine is. Um, I hit tenths and, and I wasn't even trying. How about cutting some aluminum? Beautiful finish and fast. Okay, our next test subject is some 4140. Now I'm trying to use materials that a lot of people are curious about. So we're gonna part off this little nub here and we're gonna increase the speeds now to 1200 RPMs. I got a carbide part off tool effortless. We're going to put our CCMT back on again. We're going to touch off. We'll do another hundred thousandths, which is fifty thousandths depth of cut with a nice surface finish. Get a little coolant going on here. Now let's rock and roll. So as you can see, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful finish. We know we have accurate cuts. It goes through all these various uh, various forms of metal. Here was the chip. It was a long chip. Uh, I was able to take a hundred thousand step to cut. I think that's good. In fact, maybe we will actually do a little bit more, a bigger depth of cut. There's a hundred thousand step to cut. Let's get a little coolant going. Now let's take this to two hundred thousand step to cut. There's a hundred and fifty. Let's start with a hundred and fifty. See how that behaves. Getting close. Here we go. 150,000 step to cut. All right, 
And now we're going to do 200 thousandths depth of cut with a CCMT carbide insert. Moving at 620 RPMs. Getting close. There we go. Let's do some more parting. We'll clean this piece off here. So we're parting off 304 stainless. Do we have enough? Let's see if we have enough actually to make it through. Nope, we do not. We want to go about that far and be about that far out. And then we'll lock our blade so we can make it through this big thick piece. I'm actually running this pretty slow for how small it's getting, but there we go. All right, we're setting up for threading now. I'm going to adjust the RPMs down to a slow speed of, say, 250 RPMs. We got our feed set for 20 threads per inch. Got our dials set. Zero. And let's take 10,000 scratch pass. Let me just check one thing. Yeah, we empty out good. So we're going to bring this guy back to zero on our dial. Bring it back down to zero. Feed in another 10 thou. Return to zero. Take a spring pass. Just to clean up the threads. Take another 10 thou. We'll take a couple thousands, maybe two and a half thou here, just to clean things up. And then I'll finish in with a spring pass. Just break this edge here.
So there we have it. I cleaned up the part and you can see the threads. This is the first time I'm using a threading insert and I gotta say I'm, I'm uh, really impressed. So this cool insert paired up with this machine and right off the cuff this is what you get. Gorgeous. So I, I fabricated this, uh, this tool holder rack uh, out of extruded aluminum. This is four rail extruded aluminum. Um, two bars on each side. This whole rack can move up and down and all these, uh, these caddies can move side to side. These are 3D printed. Uh, they're CXI, CXA sized uh, little caddies and you know basically you just put your tool holders on when you're done. It's really strong. It's not going anywhere and I have some angle iron on the back uh, bolted directly to the splash guard and I have these angled, I think it's an 8 degree angle, I believe it's about an 8 degree angle that I, I tilted this kind of to, to uh, follow this angle and these are little offsets and it just keeps it tilted but it's real strong and I could always, uh, I could always uh, move them around and adjust them as needed but it's, it's a great way to keep your tool holders away from the chuck. I didn't want to have it going in front of the chuck because if chips start flying or whatever they could take one of your tool holders and and send it across the room so I wanted to keep it about halfway uh, down into the uh, the chip the chip tray. Most importantly it got all my tool holders off of the top of the uh, the headstock area and my bench which I'm going to show you next. The top of this headstock area has a couple of uneven surfaces. There's like a little depression, there's uh, um, it, there's no real boundaries or anything and you know everybody puts their tools up here on rags or, or whatever. So I ordered some angle iron and I basically welded up a, a, a little tray and I put a piece of wood in it and I just found this uh, this plastic uh, like kind of rubberized plastic got like a diamond plate on it. Anyway it's uh, it's nice to put your tools on. Nothing can roll out, nothing can come out. I brought a little piece of the machine, actually one of the little oil splash guards. I took it to Lowe's and I had them mix up um, just some paint. I put a couple coats on here with a brush. Nothing, uh, nothing too detailed or complex. I think it looks great and it gives me a nice place to put the tools so nothing will fall off and, uh, and roll off onto the, onto the spindle. So this is a page right out of the book of Gavin from uh, uh, Ultimate Reloader. I saw his video and he bought the same exact uh, rolling cart. I think we got this at Home Depot. These are fantastic. They keep all your tools. Uh, I have all my turning tools up here, my tailstock accessories, all my cutting bits, chucks, you name it, it's here. In some of these other drawers we have metrology equipment, micrometers, calipers, gauge blocks, uh, various things for the mill, more metrology stuff, indicators. This lower drawer down here, that's where I keep my three jaw chuck when, uh, when I'm not using it. On this side we got more measuring equipment, calipers, squares and such, uh, all no good deburring tools. This drawer where I keep the follower and the steady rest. And all the way down here we have the face plate. We got the four jaw chuck and the, uh, the, the toolbox that comes with the lathe. All right guys, well that's it. That's the last uh, chapter in this video series on the TL1640. I can't say enough uh, about it as you've seen in, in all the videos. Um, I love it. I'm incredibly happy and satisfied with it. Uh, it was a big upgrade for my shop, well worth it, and it's definitely taking my business and my, I mean, just even my hobby machining to the next level. Love it. Highly recommend it. If you, if you want to know anything more about it that maybe I haven't covered, feel free to reach out to me um, or call Matt, you know, talk to him. He knows these machines, obviously, he sells them. Um, so with that, I thank you all for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.